Previously on the Jay and Dan podcast. Mm-hmm. I get all the leaves off of Main Street. That's my that's my duty I've taken upon myself in Orono, Ontario. I walk as far as the battery will take me. Mm-hmm. I see your uh, Halloween decorations out there. A lot of people uh, nabbing those or taking gnomes and such. I'm like, if they want them, they can have them. Aren't gnomes a, more of a Christmas thing? I don't know. Mm-hmm. It would always be snowy and freezing. We'd have our winter coats on over our costumes. Yes. And then you'd get to the house and they'd be like, who are you? I'm like, oh, under here. It's Batman, <laughs> whatever. Give me my candy. Mm-hmm. Why can't hotels have 24-hour masseuses on hand? Like... Most of them have spas, right? I can tell you why. Mm-hmm. He said, oh, well, my sister is a RMT. He's like, I'll call her right now. You can stop by her house. She'll give you a massage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hello? Are you here for your up down? <laughs> You're listening to the Jay and Dan podcast. Get off my farm! Hey now, we're into November. Wear your poppy. Don't get me started on that. I was just telling the guys over in uh, the Jan Dan area that uh, my first TV job in Vancouver, it was time to wear our poppies. And this one on-air guy's like, I don't wear a poppy. That's uh, no, just really, wait. really disrespectful. He said, I don't believe in war. We're like, this okay. is not advocating war. Yeah, We're like, hey, come on, let's bring on war. That guy sounded really woke. I sent him, I wish I had a copy of that, a very terse email about my father serving the military. And I'm like, if you don't wear a poppy, I will meet you outside. Whoa. And I will stomp your face into the ground. He wore a poppy. Wow. Today, I've heard you physically <laughs> threaten anyone. Today's like day and age, uh, I think I'd be fired for yeah, that email. I'd be fired for that. Wow. Toolsy, when he was younger, was much more of a bully. <laughs> I like it. I was a poppy bully. I'd like that that bully Dan to come back into our world. But again, the, the problem arises, and it's a, actually it's an okay problem to have because your poppy falls off all the time because of They're the, the worst. They're the but they sell worst. more. They sell more. Because you've got to buy a That's replacement. such a stupid reason to f- be slowly poked and prodded we over the course of 11 days. just a little thing on the end. Days. Just a little thing on the end. Just like a normal pin, like a button, like a pin that we, you know, the button we would all put on our jackets. Just put that on. I'll buy 10 of them and put them all over my body if I don't have to get pricked by the pin prick. Makes me feel very proud, though, walking through the airports. We, uh, we were in a lot of airports this past weekend. Oh, we Everyone we wearing the poppies and... It's great. It's great. The thing I, you know, to me, I'm starting from now on, I'm wearing them October 31st. I'm wearing them on Halloween through and then going right to November the 11th from now on because there's such confusion about whether we should wear them on TV November 1st. And that's when we always say we should wear them. We do our morning show. uh, We do our show at night on October 31st. Then we're on TV in the morning of November 1st. I want to be wearing a poppy. That morning, giving mm-hmm. as much respect as I can to the veterans yep. who served, and many of them died for us. People lied about their ages so they could fight for our country. Yeah, it's the least you can do. Is Imagine put today's this thing day on. and age. Kids on YouTube, they're like, "Okay, we need people to fight this war." Oh God! Yeah. Oh, we'd be it'd be over in a second. Yeah, this I'm generation, and I'm I'm including my generation. Me too. Yes, it would be over in a second. We're so soft. I can't. I think about that all the time. The f-ing <laughs> those guys went through in both oh world my wars. God, it's insane. They didn't even have proper it's winter insane gear. Insane what they were. What they were asked to do. Yep. And uh, so uh, and they just went and did it. Yeah, they're those guys are real. It's things. a simple thing. Just wear a poppy. It's a, if you need to explain it to a friend, then send them the email. I sent my friend. Well, maybe <laughs> don't physically threaten <laughs> in this. Now in this time, hey, what a in weekend. our time, what a weekend! First off, in what the recap of last was. week's podcast, that was the clip of my neighbor telling me, "Watch out for my Halloween decorations." An update on that: No one touched my decorations, but when I went trick or treating with my daughters, we left a pot full of candy, like it was literally a pot because I don't have any big bowls. So I put a pot full of candy on the front step so it wouldn't blow away because it was windy. With an umbrella covering it. Came back, umbrella gone, 
<laughs> pot gone, candy gone. Yeah, that's not good. But then I, I and I, that's my really, kids. Were that's like, really oh my disrespectful. But my kids were also like, oh, kind of expected yes. on Halloween. Who would do that? I'm like, it's just teenagers being teenagers, and I'm like, they're gonna realize we can't go home with this pot, so we're gonna find it around town somewhere. Yeah, they're gonna throw it. Little do we know. I told my kids before they went to bed because I was at work. I'm like, go check out front. It was back. They put it in the tree. So our pot came back the very next day. Well, we thought it, it really, was a goner. It, we, it didn't really come back. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't really return it. It was dicks. But again, yeah, I agree with you. Teenagers, if you're putting a pot out in front, something, something's probably going to happen. Yeah. Do it. Uh, we did the same thing. We, because my wife had to put the baby to bed, so I'm out trick or treating. Gonna, she put the baby out on the step. My wife. That would have been a bit much. She had to put the baby to bed. She was giving out the candy all the way up to seven, and then she's like, "I gotta put the baby to bed." So I'll, we, unlike you, we do have bowls. <laughs> I have bowls. I just they weren't big enough. So I, we put can, she put candy in the bowl and she put it on the front. Uh, step and I gotta say everyone was very respectful. Nobody took the bowl. Hmm. Uh, everyone took, you know, they probably. You're expecting they're because I think she put a note like two only, please. Or I'm like, yeah, you know what? Why even bother? They're gonna all get to take a big handful. Yes, that's what they're gonna take. It's fine. And but yeah, it worked out great. Halloween was fun, other than the torrential downpour that we had to wade through. Felt like. A, the bishop in Caddyshack when he was playing the game of his life. <laughs> just trying to get a couple of mini Twixes. It is great. It's soaked. Just to, I love it. I to, love Halloween. To soak in the excitement of the kids. They're just like, they're, they're pumped. As yeah, I said, I'm so fired. I up. sent out a tweet earlier. That <laughs> that's their World Series and like Super Bowl all in one night. They're like, so okay, fired up. This is it. I've waited all year for Absolutely. this. Absolutely. It's so much. Uh, my 15-year-old nephew still trick-or-treating. What's the cutoff? He's pushing it big time. In my, uh, I'm just a child. Oh, <laughs> my oldest, Sydney, says next year's going to be her last, grade eight. But well, I said, that seems logical, doesn't it? But like I said, the end of, uh, you know, middle school. I know, but you get into high, high school, school, your new buddies are going to be like, hey, let's go trick-or-treating. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. No, they're just out there to steal the pots. <laughs> Those I guys, need a new pot. They just want those pots. I'm a 15-year-old, and I need pot. I need to cook some potatoes. Yeah, 15-year-olds need pot. I'm sure they all think they need pot, but not that kind of pot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a fantastic weekend we had. Oh, man. The Jay and Dan live podcast tour along with Christoph. Christoph, uh, very quickly, let's ask you. You'd never been to Saskatoon or Winnipeg before. Just quick impressions of both those cities. Fabulous time. Yeah. This is probably our best time. Oh yeah, in definitely. terms of the weekends, yeah, 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 like so much fun. A lot, a lot of fun. Both in nights, show, both nights, show. very entertaining. Absolutely. After, yeah. And I have to tell you this stuff. You can attest to this. The airport system in Canada has to rank some of the best airports in the world for a country. Every airport has either just been renovated or in the process of being renovated across Canada. Winnipeg Airport. I hadn't been there since the big rental. Unreal. Saskatoon, they went uh, through a rental yep. years ago. Great Looks airport. Great. Yep. Calgary, they just finished because we had to backtrack. We had to fly to Calgary. We'll get into that. Fabulous time. facilities. Yeah, yes. nice facilities and nice people. The shows were really great and very different than the previous shows. Yes. Stoff and I have been talking about that. More, uh, more crowd interaction, I mm-hmm. think. Yeah, a little more rambunctious, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, no, it's funny. Like, but in a good every way. city we go to, the crowd is a little bit different. And yeah. I think that's really cool. Like, it resembles Canada that way. Yeah, that's right. Really yeah. cool thing. It was a cool thing. And two great theaters, the Broadway in Saskatoon, beautiful theater. Love, loved going there when I lived there. And then the Garrick, same thing. Loved going there. When, it was just a, like a dream to come back and, like, actually, I don't want to say we're performers because I, I don't know how to describe it, but to put on a show at these theaters. Yeah, all your former uh, co-workers from Winnipeg were there. That was great. We had the, I love that they turned the projection room at the Garrick into the green room. So it was a big, awesome space. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, all my old co-workers were there and uh, some of my parents' friends from uh, Dave Arnold, my parents' buddy from Palm Springs. Yep. <laughs> I love that connection. Uh, I'd, I'd met him before. I met him in Palm Springs. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, no, it was, it, was a, it was a great night. And then we went 
We went to the coolest bar in Winnipeg after called Fourth. Yes. Fourth. That's yes. what it was called. And it was like just one of those bars where you're like, if I could dream up a bar to own, that would be the kind of bar I would want to own. It was small. The music was, an, was great, but also at a very just decent the right level. volume yeah. level where we could have conversations. The drinks were spectacular. And the waitress, you know, sometimes, because let's be honest, it tipped into hipsterdom. There was a bit of a hipster vibe. Yeah. But the, there was no attitude at all. Like the, our waitress, I wish I could remember her name because she was just so nice and so sweet and very helpful with drinks because we were obviously a little out of it. And uh, yeah, she was great. I, I loved that place. Awesome time. Yeah. That was awesome. I skipped that one. I had, uh, I had McDonald's in my hotel room. <laughs> Also very hey, nice. Hey, I did. That's a good way to spend it. Skip, skip the dishes for the first time. Didn't know you could get McDonald's. Yeah, it works. Big it's, Mac. I mean, you skipped out and you just you just needed a break from us. No. And I get it. We also, again, we talk about this after every live podcast trip. We forget to eat. Yeah, we don't eat. Well, actually, though, we got wasabi on Broadway. If you yes, are that. in Winnipeg, that place is still kicking ass. We got sushi. From Skip the Dishes, and it was delicious. Terrific, yeah. Winnipeg, killing it. With the My favorite, we were driving to the venue, and uh, Stoff and I were in the back of the uh, vehicle. You're in the front with the driver, Carrie. I think it was Carrie. Yeah, Carrie. He was a man of few words. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. That's uh, I love that guy for that reason. Um, so <laughs> we're driving through Portage in Maine. I'm like, Stoff, most famous intersection in Canada. He's on his phone. I'm like, did you see? He's like... I got the gist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an intersection. It's an intersection. It's yeah. There's yeah. It's fine. But it's um, just fine. But yeah, it was to great. get to Winnipeg, we ran into a problem. Oh boy, yeah. Because Didn't think uh, this through. Y- there was no direct flights that fit our needs, so we had yeah. to be in the lobby at 4 a.m. Saskatoon on- lobby after doing the show in Saskatoon on Friday night, and then going. Your buddy, uh, who manages a radio station in Saskatoon, we went Ryan to, Zimmerman, went to to a party with Jesse Lumsden, who that was random. Stumbled into the show. He's like, "Hey, I'm in town. Do uh, you have any tickets?" I'm like, "Come on up." Yeah, Jesse happened to be in town, and uh, Olympian, former CFLer, Jesse Lumsden. Yeah, son of Neil, and he, man, what a great guy. Just yeah. love that guy. We should, you know, we should have got him on the podcast today. We could probably get him. Let's get him on. But um, you, it was great hanging out with him. And then, and then we went to uh, Congress, another bar in Saskatoon afterward. Again, fantastic. Loved it. it and then time. we were in our rooms for approximately 20 minutes? It seemed that way. I would not have made that flight had you guys not called me because uh, nobody called me from the front desk with a wake up. Well, we made our we made a pact. We said no man left that's behind. Right. Yeah, uh, and 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 when you got and a four a.m. departure, that's a very important pact to make. Because I would have left been left behind at the airport because you guys woke me up there. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, it was a series of people waking each other up to get to places. We had a good system, but you had the best line because we flew from Saskatoon to Calgary, Calgary to Winnipeg, and we got off that second flight, and it was still before noon. And you said it felt like time travel because it felt like we were just miraculously appearing in another city and the two flights didn't happen. It really felt that way. We, we all slept through them and they were instant. And then we got to Calgary at a two hour layover, slept in the lounge there. So the whole time was sleeping. It was like sleep travel. And it's like the pilots knew this. They're like, shh, quiet landing. Everyone be quiet. Quiet yeah, landing. Beautiful landings. Great work by all the Air Canada pilots. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's the second last stops on yeah. the Western Canada Tour. The last stop is two weeks in Regina. Yeah, the 15th Friday night at the Conexus Centre. Listen, it's apparently very close to being sold out. We need that to be sold out so that I... I mean, I've been gone a lot of weekends and I've been away from my wife a lot. <laughs> I need to justify these trips. <laughs> my wife. So I need you guys to buy tickets. I Regina. love it. You mentioned the, uh, it's kind of a snapshot of Canada, these shows. So much so, 
I don't know why, but I'm always amazed when we meet doctors. There's a doctor at every one of our shows. So if you have a medical emergency, there's a doctor at one of our live shows. And we, we always say to them, like, what are you doing here? We have a uh, we have a lot of women at our shows, even though I posted a picture on Instagram and everyone was making fun of the fact that it was pretty bro-heavy. Um, yeah, we have a lot of dudes who like our podcast. We have a lot of ladies. I'm always amazed how many ladies like it. Like, it's great. I'm, I'm More ladies. And also... I'm hoping that a lot of people, Dan, because one thing that happened in Saskatoon, a lot of people from Regina and the area around Regina, Yorkton, Estevan, came up to Saskatoon to see the show because they didn't think we'd be playing Regina. Well, now we are. Mm -hmm. And now that they saw how f***ing entertaining that podcast is live, I'm hoping they double down and buy ticks for the 15th that connects us. We had guys who drive trains. I couldn't, I had so many questions for the guys who Conductors. drove the CN rail. I had so many questions for the farmers because I grew up on, uh, on a farm, but we, I always say Plum to the, There was a plumber who worked for the cops. That's right. He was the cops plumber. He was the RCMP plumber. He said, we said, what do you do? We always ask everyone what they do. He said, I work for the RCMP. Cool, man. How long have you been a cop? I'm a plumber. Okay. Full time. Full time. And I love RCMP talking to the, the Western farmers because the size of their farms. This one guy came up and he crushed my hand. I still have this. I've got a doctor's appointment to figure out my hand. It's been a three-month problem. We should live podcast your doctor's appointment. So this guy crushes my hand. I'm like, yeah, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I own a farm. I'm like, okay. So we have small farms back in Ontario. At least I did. It was a 100-acre farm. I'm like, how big right. is yours? He's like, it's okay size. I'm like, how big? Right. Uh, 17,000 acres. Yeah, yeah. That's the size of like a small country. Yeah, it's, it's – and the littler farms are getting swallowed up by the big guys, right? I mean, why don't we buy a big farm? Go farm it. But then – And then we could call our show – Jay and Dan on the farm. I like that, except I drive by my fields and it'd be a big field of corn. I'm like, I gotta do all that. No, every no, day we'd hire. Like, we'd hire out. Okay. And we'd do it in Manitoba. I'd commute from the peg, from my uh, loft in the exchange district, right above Fourth, where I'd be drinking every night. We could about finally my crops. check out the museum. Hey, we were really right wanna... across from the <clears throat> children's museum. I thought it'd be creepy if I went by myself <clears throat> as a grown man. So yeah, maybe a bit. So I didn't go to that. I did go to the old train station. Great coffee shop in there in Winnipeg. If you ever buy the Inn at the Forks, go get some coffee at that place. It was stellar. Yeah, I really, I really and, love that hotel. <clears throat> and there's a burger joint in the Winnipeg airport in uh, the domestic area. And it's called like... Uh, you should look it up. North or something. Best burger I've had in years. It, it, it changed, changed my, my life. life. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's great. That's great. I'm glad you guys had such a good time in the peg because, man, I always do. I love that town. I think it's just f***ing solid. I'm going to look this up here. Okay, while you're looking that up, um, I think we should dial up our, our guest. And True Burger. True Burger Company. There you go. So go check that out. True Burg. Troobs. Our guest today, this is really fascinating. He is the drummer for the Black Crows. And we've had him on our podcast before back in L.A., Mr. Steve Gorman. A great guy. He's been doing lots of radio over the course of his career, in addition to drumming for the Crows. He's been doing sports radio. He's been doing a ton of stuff. Um, right now, uh, Steve has uh, a new gig. Uh, and it is uh, the Steve Gorman Rocks Show. Classic rock radio, 7 to 12 Eastern Time on Westwood One, Monday through Friday. So he's working a lot. Um, I want to start off with some touring questions on how, how you can do that every night. Like, we do two stops every two weekends. Yeah. And I'm like, one more stop, and that could be lights out for Toolsy. Yeah, it's amazing. I thought of the very same thing as I was reading his book. So the reason we're having Steve on is because, uh, and Steve's in a car in New York City right now. The reason we're having Steve on is because he, along with Steve Hyden, if you want to follow someone, you want to know what's going on in music right now, follow Steve Hyden on Twitter. And Steve co-wrote this book with Steve Gorman. It's called Hard to Handle, The Life and Death of the Black Crows. Fantastic. Uh, we just crushed it. I can't recommend this enough to the music fan in your life around the holidays. Uh, holiday season's coming up, right? Mm -hmm. It's happening. 
you got to pick this book up because it's a killer. And I believe we've got Steve on the line. Steve, how are you? You're in New York City. I am in, uh, well, I'm actually in New Jersey attempting to get away from Monday night football traffic as we speak. Oh, mm. God. Unbelievable. How much, you are a huge sports fan. Like, like, are you still, even though you're not doing sports radio now, are you still as obsessed with sports as you ever were? Or are you No. Still, no. No, I, <laughs> not even <laughs> close. I was, uh, when, when, when I pulled the plug on that sports show, I needed a break. I got, uh, I got really tired of having to think about sports instead of just appreciating it. So I, well, I, I still watch stuff, but like this NFL season has completely gone past me with very little notice. Well, the way the Falcons have been, it's probably for the best, Steve. <laughs> well, I'm a Titans fan. So, oh, you're yeah. in Nashville now. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, let's, let's get right into the book. First of all, just loved it. Thought it was fantastic. Think you did Thank a great you. job. And one of the, things that immediately caught my attention because I just read Jeff Tweedy's uh, Wilco book and Jeff really goes deep into the family life, the upbringing, what made him who he is as a person. You're like that. (laughs) You're like the book starts with you basically getting dropped off and meeting Chris Robinson for the first time. Was that a conscious decision to just get right into it? I, I, I knew, I knew that like black crows, big diehard black crows fans are going to read this book. Uh, A lot of them are, but, you know, by design, too, I'd like other people that may, maybe aren't as in, involved or uh, aware of our music to still find it a compelling story. And so, you know, backstory, youngest child in a uh, middle class family of 10, you know, whatever. We've all seen that before. You know, just, I just wanted to get right into the part that anybody who's picking it up is going to be most interested in. And I just started reading it last night, Steve, and you gave me anxiety right away because you were at your first rehearsal for a band and you were sitting at the drums and you're like, I don't even know really how to play. Yeah, you know, it was a little bit of the cart in front of the horse. But, you know, uh, it's I, I, I've made a lot of things happen by saying I can do it. And then sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But it is amazing to think because I think you are so associated with the band. You and Chris and Rich, you know, the three of you were sort of uh, the original band. That, you know, you talk about right. that throughout the book. Different members came and went and were very integral to the process, obviously. But the core of the group was the three of you. And you, you talk about it. I mean, you bought your first kit when you got to Atlanta to meet these guys. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, I'd spent years, uh, you know, cramming my brain, uh, preparing for the test, if you will. I was, the only thing I wanted to do was play drums, and I was obsessed with drums and, and rock records and how the drums fit. I, I really do think it was a bit of a, an extreme example of a lifetime of preparation. Um, and it, and it, was a, it was a strength and a weakness. Like, I didn't really know how to play but I knew what not to do. And when you're a young drummer in a local band, knowing what not to do is actually more important. So let's, for people who are maybe casual fans of the band, and I think you really address this well in the book, like Shake Your Money Maker, the first album, gigantic. I, you know, like a lot of people, I remember it clear as day. It absolutely ruled the summer of 1990. It was so massive. I remember the second album, The Southern Harmony Musical Companion. I remember lineups in Edmonton where I lived, lineups for people to get that CD. You were right. so popular. And then you talk about if, you know, how you guys squandered those opportunities. And it started, weirdly enough, with uh, an album that our mutual friend, Engineer Jim, was involved in called Tall. Um, right, right, right. And it's amazing that and, you know, we have Engineer Jim on the show all the time. It's amazing to me. And he's mentioned in the book for, for fans of Jim. Uh, it's amazing that that's sort of where the trajectory started to go downward, at least from a massive popularity perspective. Well, and, and you know, it, it, it's, it's tough, but, you know, I blame Jim, of course. <laughs> his, his As you should. We, we all know that he's a man who, you know, he, he, he sets fire to anything he touches. <laughs> and, uh, can you tell us a story, w- like when you, were, when you guys were doing it, can you tell us what he was like? Because he's such a sweet guy, and you're talking about Chris Robinson being almost like a bully. Uh, I well, can't... Well, well, Chris, you know, Jim, Chris brought Jim in, so, of course, he saw Jim as his guy. Right. So he was, he was great with him. The problem was Rich also saw Jim as Chris's guy. Right. And so Rich really never gave him a chance. Jim was fantastic. You know the answer to that better than I do because you guys worked with him a lot longer than I did. He was completely accommodating, 
up for trying just about anything. You know, anybody has an idea, he goes, let's do it, guys. Let's see what happens. And super encouraging. Um, you know, he would talk about the band um, with, with some detachment, you know, but he he always made sure that we knew how much he appreciated what kind of band we were, just as a live playing unit. And, you know, confidence is everything live and in the studio. You know, when you when you sit down at the kit or you plug in that guitar, when you look behind the glass, you can see a lot of different faces. And with Jim, it was almost like we could tell, like, he couldn't wait for what we were about to do. And you can't overstate how much that means to a band, individually and collectively. He was an absolute pleasure to work with. So after you have hit songs as a band, you get into the studio, do you guys feel anxiety? You're like, oh, God, we need a hit. We need a hit. Are you playing a song, say, this isn't the hit, this song's not going to no, work? What no, do you do? You know, our first record, we, we didn't have that at all. I mean, to, to our credit and kind of to a detriment, we never, ever, ever thought like that. And, you know, the first album we recorded on a shoestring budget, and it didn't sound like rock radio in 1989. So when it blew up in 1990, we were just stunned. You know what I mean? And we didn't, our producer George heard hits and he was thinking about choruses that were catchy, but he never let us know that's what he was thinking. So we were just putting songs down that, that we loved, we worked on and that George finished, you know, he wrote with the brothers or at least arranged and got them, got what they had written into better shape. And then it blew up, and so we thought, well, we weren't trying to have hits on the first record. We're not going to change that system. So we just wanted to make records that we loved and that we thought were great. I mean, it was it sounds so simple, but that's really how we look at it. And if there was anything, if we thought about anything about success, it was almost more like, well, what can we do to shoot ourselves in the foot a little bit? Like, we didn't want to ever be seen as chasing, you know, platinum sales. And, and, you know, we weren't chasing it. The fact that we made an effort to not be seen to be chasing it shows you that you can overthink just about anything in this world. And this band was so many different things. You know, you, you were massive hit makers at the beginning and then sort of your, the band itself, like you talk about in the book, the band got better, got better as a live unit. It makes sense. You were playing so many shows. But then uh, Chris wanted to take it in a, almost a jam band direction at one point. Yeah, very much so. And, and it seems like, but, you know, you also allude to it, there are certain fans of the band who really like that era of the band. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I mean, it, it, it split the fan base, you know, in, in several fractions. We did that repeatedly over time. We, we took a, a, a great, we had this wonderful coalition, and, uh, and we kept dividing them uh, <laughs> over, over time, which, you know, it was a little, we were like the anti-Marshall Tito, uh, you know what I mean? Right. We like, we were the guys splitting off all the factions as opposed to trying to keep them all under one, uh, one umbrella. Um, he was, you know, I, I think Chris really, in 92 and 93, I think he was a really special, unique uh, front man and artist. And across the board, he, he was very authentic and he'd found himself. And I, and I think that, you know, I'll, I'll go full Dr. Phil for a second. I think when he found himself, he didn't like what he found. And so he decided he had to be something else. Um, and I think that when the band found its truest existence in those same years, uh, during the, the making of and touring for the second album is when we really discovered who we could be. Um, it wasn't all about him. It, it never had been, but I think he really wanted to be the leader and he wanted to guide the band in a way that, like, George Shaculius, our producer, guided us for the first two records. Pete, our manager, was brilliantly guiding our career, and Chris just wanted to get some of that. And it was to our eternal detriment that, that he did, and that we were never able to um, very, uh, you know, we were never able to successfully steer it back on course. It, we could, but never for the long term. You mentioned uh, touring. So Jay and I, uh, off the top, uh, we were talking about we did our live podcast in a couple of cities. We do two stops every two weeks. So it's it's a very small tour. But even just two stops a weekend every two weeks, we we're like, how could you ever do a show every night, get on planes? How do you survive being in a rock band and touring? Well, it helps to have it start young. It's <laughs> stupid to know that it's really insane. You know, I mean, like, when our first record came out, I was 24, and I was the oldest guy in the band by a year and a half. 
So, you know, and it's all we ever wanted. And, you know, when you want something that you don't really know what that means and then you start to get it, it's really hard to go, wait, this isn't what I wanted. It's especially when it's succeeding wildly. So you, we just got conditioned. I mean, you know, the hardest part of touring wasn't the touring. The hardest part of touring was each other, was the way our band operated and the, and the dysfunctional culture of the band is what wore everybody down. And, and the drugs and the, and, the, and the codependency and the addiction and, you know, all of those elements – any family that's ever dealt with addiction understands what it's like to be in a rock band. You know, it's, it's the same elements at play. You've got people whose lives are out of control. They're spinning everyone else's life out of control. And in the case of a band, they're spinning the band out of control. And, the, and everyone else is doing all they can to try to straighten out the ship. And you look up one day and go, man, we spent all this energy just trying to keep on the road and, and not go off. And, and, you know, what if we had spent our energy creating together instead of, just trying not to explode. It might have been a very different story. You address uh, something that I've always wondered about. And uh, Kate, the name Kate Hudson doesn't come until quite late in the book. In fact, I, I started to wonder if you were even going to mention her. But you're very flattering about Kate Hudson. In fact, you clear up a myth that I always believed, and you point out that a lot of Crows fans believe this, that she was a disruptive, almost Yoko Ono presence in the band. But as you point out, in fact, for a while, she was the person who kept Chris in line. Uh, she did very much. Well, I mean, she doesn't come into the book for a while because she, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, she wasn't there for very long. Um, uh, but, but no, when she did there, she made an immediate impact. I mean, she told him two things, stop doing drugs and get along with your brother. And he <laughs> said, okay. And then the rest of us immediately thought about building a statue of her <laughs> um, because that's all we'd ever wanted, you know, get, get, get healthy and, and stop getting, st- you know, let, let's not be wasted seven days a week. And why don't you stop trying to kill your brother? And she came in and just immediately that stopped for a little while. And, um, you know, there were, you know, it's funny because people have said that, oh, Kate was this disruptive force. Um, no, the other women in his life, there was quite a murderer's row, but Kate <laughs> Hudson was not one of them, I can assure you. Did you guys get to the point where you had to have, like, two separate uh, tour buses to keep the brothers apart? No, the, there was a brief period of time in 95 when Rich had his own bus. Um, but but we, we were never at a place where that was financially acceptable to the rest of us. It was like, if you guys, I encouraged them to fight. After a certain point, I told them all the time, please. One of you kill the other one. Just <laughs> pick up a chair and break his face open with it. You know, because that's – and, I, and I, you know, it's but – but I was serious because I have five older brothers, and I know that the older brother never lets up until the younger brother kicks his ass. And Rich had never done it. And, you know, Rich always had 40 pounds on him. I'm like, dude, just choke him till he passes out. It'll be over. <laughs> And he never did, and, and it never went away. And it, it was an omnipresent, you know, uh, and it, it was like the, uh, you know, it was just a virus, and everybody gets infected when you have two people that treat each other that way. Okay, let's talk about something more positive. If you are a Zeppelin fan, and who isn't, you're going to love this book because both Page and Plant feature prominently uh, Robert Plant, almost like a, uh, like a, like an uncle to you guys at a stage of your career when you probably need it. You were opening for his band at one point. He was really good to you. And then, almost incredibly, Jimmy Page essentially joined the band, and you toured with him for a while, and inexplicably the brothers rejected his proposal (laughs) to contribute music to the band. Like, it almost... you describe it so beautifully in the book, like you were so full of rage at, at finding the truth because Jimmy Page told right. you that personally. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, I, it's, I've had a lot of people say, man, you're still so upset about that. I'm like, no, that was me in 2002, okay? I'm, 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 pretty, I'm bringing you into my mindset at the time. But yeah, no, that was um, in, a, in a world filled with, you got to be kidding me, that one, that, that set the bar at a, you know, up until that moment at a, at a height I would have never imagined possible. At the uh, the start of the book, you, you mentioned moving to uh, Georgia and that you're a big REM fan. So, uh, again, I've just started the book. Jay just uh, lent me his copy. Um, do you get to the point where you play on bills with REM? 
You know, we never did. We, what? we did a festival. We, we never did. We did a festival in Denmark that they were on, but they were on a different stage, like at the same time. So we didn't even see them then. Um, we, uh, cause you know, but well, when, when our first two albums blew up, they weren't on the road. You remember they, they stopped touring at, at, at a time when they sold their most records, um, automatic for the people and, uh, out of time, my religion. Yeah. Out of time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they did not tour for four years. Yeah. And so by the time they hit the road back with Monster in like 95, we did a festival at the same time as them. But, you know, we, were, we weren't opening for other bands by then, and they weren't, you know, they, they were just doing whatever they were doing. They were just playing arenas all over the world by then. Did you uh, ever play on a bill with a uh, Canadian super band, The Tragically Hip? Yes. Uh, oh, very yeah. early on we did, and, and met those guys during the Shake Your Moneymaker tour. Um, and then, of course, we were all, in 1991... Um, the Black Crows had a quick break in tour, and I was home in Atlanta, and I went to see Kids in the Hall at a, at a small theater. Awesome. And we were obsessive Kids in the Hall fans. And I met them after the show, and we all went out to a bar with uh, five kids and Norm Hiscock, the head writer. And the night ended with Bruce being arrested for public intoxication. <laughs> Bruce and McCullough. we were sealed for like, friends for life from that, <laughs> as one does. And then, and then, then they were in New York a few days later, and then Chris met him that night, and they had a, no one got arrested, but they all went out with him, and then we were off and running, so we were tight with those guys, really. I mean, I mean, anytime we were in Toronto for for the first part of our career, we were running with those guys, and they were friends with the tragically hip guys, um, and so we there was a few times where we were with them and saying hi and hanging out, ne- nothing ever beyond that, but they were always good guys and they were a great band. I, th- I mean, I'm not telling you anything. Well, I think you didn't. You mention the book that Chris and Kate met at a Kids in the Hall show. Uh, yeah, that's right. They did. That's Years hilarious. Later, like, in two, like 2000. Maybe. And you grew up with SCTV too. Oh, big time! Man. Ah, like, that's like, hilarious. That's 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 still the uh, when I on Steve Gorman Sports when I would have a Canadian guest, my first question was always. Kids in the Hall or SCTV, and I could hear their angst yeah. right over the phone. Like, oh, no, how could I choose? And, yeah. and, of course, they don't want to be rude. So it was always, I, I love torturing Canadians with that question. <laughs> That's a real Sophie's choice for Canadians, for sure. Yes, of course. It is. <laughs> uh, Steve, um, so I asked you if it was okay if I asked you about this. Uh, today, kind of weirdly breaking news about the Black Crows, and, and nothing's been confirmed, but there is rumors that the Crows are going to reunite and tour in 2020. So I guess my first question is, are you involved in this tour in any way? No, not in any way. That is a Brothers Robinson production with an entirely new band. And uh, you talk about the fact that they decided to do that at one point to tour without you. And then uh, you mentioned Pete, the manager, who, man, that guy took a lot of abuse over the years. Um, uh, you mentioned that he convinced you to come back. Do you see any, is he still managing the band? And is, do you see no. any situation? No, no. no, no he's, he's not. He, no. he will not be involved in any level, nor will I. Okay. So I guess that answers all the questions. There was no, not even any contact because... You know, there was a lot of issues with financial compensation, and, and you talk about it at the beginning of the book. That's essentially why the band stopped. Um, yeah, they, no, they've not contacted me, and they never will. I mean, they're, they're not doing this to... They're, they're not about to call anyone that's going to be... that's going to demand a, a share of the money. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. That's not, that, this, this tour is not about anything other than uh, they've both panned themselves into some corners, and they need to get out of them. Have and you talked so, to the either brothers since the book came out? No. I haven't spoken to Chris in about six years, and I haven't spoken to Rich in three years. So, yeah. So, you, like you said, you, you've you alluded to them painting themselves into financial corners and, and essentially reunion tour. Right, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I look, they have every right to do it, and I'm not I, – I don't – anybody that could go out and make a living playing music, I'd say, God bless, go do it. I mean, that's fine. But it'll be interesting to hear when they announce it what the spin is because they spent the last six years just from each other and, and one-upping each other on how much they can rip the other guy apart. And now that they're both at a place where they need to do this, they're doing it. They're not involving anybody that was ever there in the past, which tells you every single thing you need to know about why this is happening. And again, that's fine, but it's just there's nothing about that that is of any interest to me.
Well, I'll tell you what should be of interest to our listeners, and that's your book, uh, Hard to Handle, The Life and Death of the Black Crows. Fantastic stuff. You and Steve Hyden, you guys did a great job of it. Uh, I encourage you. everybody to pick it up. And uh, Steve Gorman, it was great chat with you, man. You're an awesome guy, and uh, and now you're a regular on the podcast. This is your second appearance, so so you're practically a friend of ours now. I uh, I am, and I'm and I'm happy for both of those. And I'm uh, and and I will at some point be in Toronto talking about the book, and I'm going to choke both of you down to be there and, and appear with me. That yes, would, that would be an amazing time. That would be an amazing time. Maybe we can fi- convince uh, Jim to fly up with you, and you know, we'll we'll have a. A crazy, crazy yeah, night we'll, out. We'll, we'll do it. We'll, we'll we'll play the tall outtakes <laughs> while we uh, field questions from the from the fans. We'll call Bruce McCullough. He lives in town. We'll call all Mark McKinney, Foley. We'll get everybody out. It'll be wild. It'll be great. I well, no, I, I was and I can't say it. I was going to say Mark had a funny comment about the book, but uh, I, I'll let him say it next time you talk to him. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Good. Good chatting with you, my friend. Have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, fellas. Uh, talking about the uh, the band getting back together made me uh, think. So if we retire and I'm like hard up for money, I'll be like, <laughs> "Hey, the the John and Dan tour." Well, I I, I get a guy that kind of looks like you, <laughs> and now featuring Stiff, not Stuff. <laughs> well, I always thought I was thought, dude. I wished that. James Sabalski still worked at TSN because I always thought it would be funny if we could do bits where he, where the execs basically tried to squeeze one of us out by saying that we we're going to be replaced by Sabalski. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen. James and Dan. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's we were cool. watching the Good Monday guy. Nighter here <laughs> during that interview. There was a black cat on the field for. Um, for a good five minutes, so that is going to be something that the Giants fans are going to bring up yeah. for the rest of eternity because that was a symbol of something. No, and no. how does a cat get into a football stadium? And a black cat. Like, somebody had to set that up, right? And also... Sir, let us frisk you. <laughs> Meow! Nothing here. Nothing here. Meow! Is that a bit of a... You got, uh, like, a fur coat under your other coat? Or? I know this, Dan, that... That black cat will inspire oh, tomorrow's yes. top ten yes. animal moments. Pussy on the field. <laughs> Here, pussy. Oh yeah, it's gonna be all. Yes, it's gonna be right? in-game animals. There's gonna be that. The the one that we always show is the mascot chasing the little pig, and he throws his mascot head at it very violently. That's gonna be there. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. To get the pig to just. Roll over. Speaking of security and someone trying to sneak a cat, I was just like envisioning us going through that airport security in Saskatoon. One of us was probably lying through the metal detector with our luggage, just (laughs) this (laughs) lying down on the conveyor belt. Yeah, I, I actually still, I'm still amazed we made it (laughs) to Winnipeg. Eh, That you know. We should be proud of ourselves. What if we hadn't made it? That would have been bad. Well, that would have been a rental car. Eight hours. I looked it up several times how long that drive was. Yeah. Saskatoon to Winnipeg, a solid eight. Yeah. A solid I eight. did it once. I did it once when I was moving from Saskatoon to Winnipeg. But, yeah, I, I was not interested in repeating that. <laughs> not interested in repeating it. So, as Dan alluded to earlier, Friday, November 15th, two weeks from now, Regina. Regina. And we're going to be bringing it because that's the only live podcast we're doing that weekend. So we're going to leave it all out on the stage. That's right. We're making stop miss that flight the next day. Yes, yes. Because we're sticking around in the Giant to go to a Pats game the next night. And then Stoff starts his new life in Saskatchewan. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> yeah. Regina. Experience Regina. November 15th. Stop. You can join the Regina Grey Cup Center. Grey Cup Committee because they host the Grey Cup next year. So you can just stay there and start work. You can work for Derek Taylor. So, so you don't have to be hired. You can just join one of these things? It's kind of like the Costanza. You show up at the office and say, okay, guys, what's on the schedule today? They're like, oh, I guess this is the new young go getter that we just hired. Perfect. It's stuff.
He's a giant guy now. <laughs> <laughs> then you really have to get stiff for the next day. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't be replaced. We, you got to get stiff to get into the giant. Oh, sorry. By the way, we, <laughs> we introduce stuff at every show. Place goes bonkers. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, it's fantastic. So much fun. We had special guests. Again, we're not going to say who. We had special guests. We'll have special guests in Regina. Eventbrite.ca. And then, soonish, we'll announce Eastern Canada stops for 2020. Or maybe 2021. We're having a little trouble with venues. <laughs> Don't be surprised. Hey, Orono if Town we Hall. Push it off a year. Yeah, we might be doing some some Ontario dates. Orono Town sure Hall. 20. If you rent it Monday to Thursday, very reasonable rates. But we work Monday to Thursday. The price isn't the problem. They're just booked. All these maritime uh, venues that we want to. Well, the problem is we we're like, most bands can like they can perform on a Tuesday, but we've got two days a week that we can do it Friday or Saturday. No, I don't like to say it that way. I like to say it. We make it family friendly so daddy and mommy can have a date night out. They can oh, get yeah. a babysitter and they don't have to worry about going to work the next oh, day. That's sure. why we do yeah. Friday, Saturday. I thought you were going to say the, on, it'll be fine. the live podcast is family friendly. And I was like, no, nah, it's definitely not. So Billy Joel plays a uh, concert at Madison Square Gardens once a month. He's doing that till he dies, I think. Some of them are like on Wednesdays, Tuesdays. Billy, come on. Come on. Hey, he's got other stuff on the go. Okay. All right, guys. So, yeah. Great weekend. Thanks again to everybody in Saskatoon and Winnipeg. Amazing time. You guys, you guys kill it. And thanks again to Steve Gorman. And we'll see you in Regina on the 15th. Did Jason Witten just score a touchdown? I, I wasn't watching that moment. We'll recap it, though, on SportsCenter with Jay and oh, Dan. No.